Uh, hello, everybody. This is Nick Zeppos. I'm the Chancellor of Vanderbilt University, and this is episode one of the Zeppos Report. And this is an unusual opportunity for Vanderbilt, for me, to really sit with the amazing people on our campus who focus on current events, trends in the world, and really share those insights with people who are thirsting for knowledge and opinion on where is our country going, where is our world going, where is the SEC going. We have a full range of topics. I couldn't be more pleased. My first guest is you know, my good friend, professor of political science, John Gere. Uh, we all know John. We love John. He's a guru in polling, uh, the definitive book on political advertising, negative advertising. And I brought John in to kind of start really to educate us and inform us on, John, what the heck's going on? I mean, we, we've been through the campaign, and, you know, I have a lot of people still want to talk about the campaign. But mm-hmm. now we're into President Trump. What, what, what do we make of the campaign, and what do we make of where we are now? Well, we're all trying to still figure that out. I mean, it's Trump's breaking all the rules, and he's doing so in a way that uh, befuddles the media. I think he, um, and I think you might like this analogy, what Trump does is throw out chum almost every day through tweets and through other kinds of statements, and the news media go feed on it, while he then tries to pursue, you know, kind of more substantive strategy, or at least some of his aides does do that. And so he, you know, he hasn't changed much. The campaign is actually somewhat of a predictor of what, of how he's been as president. You know, if somebody challenges him, he goes right back at him. Uh, he doesn't like anything that doesn't suggest he's not popular. Uh, and whether it's crowd size or, or uh, in, in regards to his inauguration, you know, he's just doing all these kinds of, of things. And the n- news media just don't know how to, how to deal with him. And it'll be really interesting to see how if they get into a rhythm or or he makes maybe some really big mistakes we just you know we just don't know this is a a new world order and he's brought it into into play and people underestimated him and i don't think it's probably the way to proceed going forward yeah and and he can say you don't like how i'm doing this i won it worked yeah and so and for a politician a president a person with a lot of self-confidence is that what he's thinking Every day? Yeah, you know, I don't, it's hard to anticipate, you know, what fire, what fires him up on a particular day. I mean, he's somewhat, I don't want to say erratic. I think there's a method to his madness. I really do. Um, he understood how tweets could drive, the, drive a campaign. No one thought that was the case. I mean, it was always political ads before, which is one of the things I care about and study. Uh, he may have blown up my world. Yeah. Um, because now, if you think about the ads that used to matter so much, I'm not so sure they do. But he's able to drive the narrative through these tweets. And then when he makes public statements, he makes sure they're pretty outrageous. And that gets the coverage. Um, and he understands the media far better than certainly Hillary Clinton and, and most of the campaign advisors that she paid lots of money to, too. Yeah. Well, you talk about a kind of a governing strategy where the media is kind of following a track on a tweet, and then he's doing something substantive. But yet he does seem to bring them together, which is I'm going to tweet things, and then I'm going to impose a tariff on Mexico. I'm going to cancel a meeting. There are substantive things he's actually doing um, in spheres that he can act more unilaterally. Yeah, he certainly – I mean, just take the number of uh, of, – not proclamations. I'm now forgetting the executive orders. executive orders. Yeah. I mean, he's you know he's done a huge number of them, far more than than most presidents. Though Obama actually started out with a sizable number of executive orders as well. But he's certainly pushing that. It's almost like you know I keep wondering if he realizes that Congress is there. Um, I do think that he what what I don't uh, what we don't have enough data on yet, and as as the presidency unfolds over the course of the coming years. Are these all kind of equivalent of old trial balloons where, you know, he'll say a 20 percent tax on imports from Mexico? I don't know. Does he really want that or is that just some sort of opening salvo and he expects it to go in some other direction? We, we just don't, you know, don't isn't, know. Isn't it really Trump, President Trump, the negotiator? That's I'm gonna right. Do this. I'm going to do this. And then I'll push you so hard. You'll come back 
with a better counter. Well, that's what he's that's what he's hoping for, and it'll be interesting to see. I mean, like you know, I was thinking people want to make a big deal about when the Mexican president canceled the visit, but that's just the negotiation. Um, that you know, we'll see where it ends up. Does in fact Trump get something out of out of Mexico in some way, shape, or form, or does he end up getting something out of China and his negotiations there? You know, we just you know, this is all new territory. He's he's making lots of people nervous in the international arena, for example. But we don't know if that nervousness is actually going to lead to less conflict because people don't want to rattle us, rattle them. Yeah. We just don't know yet. Yeah. What about uh, you know looking back at the two campaigns, what Trump is doing now? Are the Democrats sitting around saying, I don't know what they're saying. I mean, they go into their retreats and are they saying, what's our Trump strategy? What's our who is our Trump? There is no other such thing as a Trump. What? How do they respond to the loss and the success of this methodology and technique? Well, that, that's that's one of the things that needs careful thought. And I don't think the Democrats are in a position. They're still stunned. And you know, every once in a while they say, oh, well, we won the popular vote. Yeah, that's true. They won the popular vote regardless of what Trump says. But that doesn't matter. The Electoral College was clear. He won over 300 electoral votes. I mean, he, you know, he did pretty well. And so how do you ha- handle this? There is two schools of thought. First of all, if I were Hillary Clinton, I'd ask for a full refund from all her advisors because she did not get good advice. But it's predicated on this notion that Obama had all this great micro-targeting and he was brilliant in his campaign against Romney. And I think that's a misreading of 12. I think that basically the economy was growing. It was a first-term president. The, the incumbent should have won by about 51, 47, and that's exactly what he won. I don't think his strategy paid any dividends. It was the fundamental forces of the campaign and the election that allowed him to win. And I think the same thing was going on in 2016. It wasn't all this micro-targeting, spending money in Ohio or Wisconsin or wherever. What mattered was that the economy was struggling, was doing okay, but not great. We had a Democrats in the office for two, two terms, and the country wanted change. And Hillary Clinton was the poorest vehicle possible for change. Yet the Democrats got handed this gift of a candidate who was certainly about change, but for a lot of people was bad change. And he managed to eke out a victory in the Electoral College, or well, more than eke out, I guess, but at least it was, a, you know, it was close in, in some ways. And it was a, driven by the fundamentals. I mean, when you had the release of that, that tape, you know, with the, the, where he made those outrageous comments or the email stuff, nothing moved public opinion. The public was mad. And they were so mad that, in fact, in some of the Midwest states with large numbers of, of, un, of uneducated whites, they wouldn't even do polls, which led to bad estimates down the road there. And I think that it's, it's a statement that our polarization has not just affects the parties and how they govern, but 95 percent of the public was locked in yeah. and nothing was going to change well, anything. What about talk about advisors? And you work with a lot of advisors and – You've known a lot of politicians. You've taught with politicians. To what extent is it the candidate or the advisors? And, you know, how much have you all started to look at? She might have gotten good advice. She might have gotten bad advice. He was getting advice from a lot of advisors and then three people, five people in his family and people who were not in the establishment. So generally speaking... The advisors on the professional class was wrong on both sides. Well, that's right. The Trump people didn't expect to win. I mean, they they didn't even have an acceptance. And the Republican from. Party elite establishment advisors were all locked up with the other candidates, weren't they? Yeah, that's right. Oh no, I, the advisors in general misunderstood what was going on, and Trump got got it in a way that nobody else understood um, that right. And so that's the classic question if. You know, is Hillary Clinton a bad enough candidate that she just didn't have very good advisors? It's also true that you've got to know when to take your advice or not. For example, you know, from what I can gather, and I have some sources, President Clinton himself was constantly arguing, we need to spend more time in the working class. We need to worry, focus more mm. on these. These are my people, but they're unhappy, and we're missing the boat. And I think, you know, he had the, he got it. And I don't think many of the other Democrats did. It's just not Hillary Clinton's strength. Yeah. You know, governing could be her strength, but campaigning, 
just wasn't wasn't her strength. And Trump had this new technique. I mean, in some sense, he understood one of the things that we can say about the media is they love conflict. Oh yeah, I mean, and and it, in the past, from basically 1988 to 2012, that conflict was embedded in the ads. And so you had very famous attack ads, whether it be something like a Swift Boat Swift ad Boat, or a Willie Horton yeah. or whatever. Those drove the narrative. Yeah. But if you look at the 2016 ads, they were dull. They were worse than the Super Bowl oh, ads. Uh, oh, they were I mean, horrible. I don't know that there were any winners there. There was none. I go back and watch the old Apple ad. Yeah, exactly. And there was no good ad or uh, on either side. And Trump's ads themselves were kind of run of the mill as well. But what Trump did was he drove the narrative through his tweets, and he talked about the need for change. And the public isn't sophisticated enough to, to have detailed assessments of different policies or whatever. They knew that we had to bring change. They wanted the apple cart upset. You know, the old theory that our friend Larry Bartels and lots yeah, of other people tout. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's retrospective voting, and it was time for change. Right. And, you know, Trump would have won by more if he hadn't been so controversial because a lot of people, for good reasons, were worried about the kind of change he'd bring. But you talk to, you know, the taxi cab driver who takes you from the airport to your hotel, he or she will talk about, well, Trump will change things. Right. And that's what they're, that's what this election was about. And, you know, Hillary Clinton was the worst change agent we could possibly have, and she barely won the nomination right. against a 74-year-old socialist from Vermont. Mm -hmm. And he, you know, ex except for the Democratic rules that gave her some protection, he might well have won that nomination. What about, you know, it's kind of everything is, well, if we'd had this, that, would he have been a better nominee? You know, I've thought I mean, a little. Uh, and I don't know, do you have any, is there something responsible in your data that show that? It's hard to it's hard to know because the difficulty is that Trump would have probably run a different campaign. It wouldn't have been crooked Hillary. He would have had to figure out how to play off against uh, Sanders' ca call for change versus his, it would have thrown things in a very different direction. I, you know, the the re classic Republican kind of campaign that would have been able to be run against a socialist from Vermont that, you know, he's too liberal wasn't going to work in this camp. This this uh, call for change, so it'd be really, you know, really interesting. Obviously, since Hillary Clinton lost, you'd say, well, at least he'd have a chance. But it would have been a very interesting campaign because it would all have been about change and then the different kinds of change. And he might, you know, he might have done, you know, better in some of those Midwestern states because of the yeah, kinds of change he wanted. Yeah, you've got to start wanted. thinking, you know, and this is all hindsight's twenty twenty. But, you know, maybe Ohio, which is always tough, mm -hmm. perhaps for Democrats, but Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan are very maybe different. He's there all the time maybe, Yeah, Bernie Sanders. No, that's right. And, you know, he's he's doing rallies and— that's where he's going to campaign. Yeah, and he could have done well. I think a candidate like Joe Biden would have beaten Trump yeah. because he has a connection to the working class based on his own background coming from Pennsylvania, and he's more of a, you know, he doesn't have the sense of privilege that the Clintons yeah. have, and that's just yeah. true. How much, how much is it personal, too? All the polls showed in the state I was born in, Wisconsin, she was way ahead. Yep. Russ Feingold's way ahead, and... Yeah. I think they could have put Robert, a dead Robert LaFollette on there. They would have said he's way ahead. And then I don't know that she ever went to Wisconsin. Not so, only did she not go to Wisconsin, she didn't buy ads either. Yeah, and, the last and then month. she didn't advertise. Yeah. But how much does Twitter or how much does Facebook say, I want to feel you, I want to touch you, that the, the, the electorate's like she just doesn't care about us and that her physical and – personality presence is not felt in those states. She's just, you know, Trump, whether he's there or not, he's there. Yeah, no, there's and a different dynamic. If, and then he's there physically. Mm -hmm. And and he spends really no time there. He flies in, does things on the tarmac, right. flies out, two days of news, and all people can talk about is he really listens to us and cares about us. Yeah, and that was the the advantage that he had, and he understood it, and the and he did it through, you know, the the tweets themselves. How many people actually follow him? It's quite a su substantial number, but you know, the amount of free coverage he got. There's yeah. a, there's a great graph that if you look at the amount of money he spent on ads, right, versus the amount of money that he or the campaign spending in general versus the amount of free coverage he got, his ROI is off oh, the right. charts. Right. 
I mean, he got you know four to five billion dollars worth of free coverage mm -hmm. for basically a pretty modest campaign budget. Right. By contrast to Hillary Clinton spending you know t two times, maybe even three times as much money, and not getting nearly that kind of and, coverage. And that was even more true in the primaries. Oh yeah, where you know all these well-funded candidates and they're trying to get airtime or position themselves. I've got a policy speech, and he tweets out. Yeah. You know something about, you know, uh, you know his new golf course right. or something like that, and <laughs> and you know how bad Obama is golfing or why is he golfing here? I invited him or and then you know and 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 there's Jeb, there's no oxygen in the room, yeah. and so that should have really been telling to the Clinton people, which is yeah, yeah they just didn't you take... you know if you think your news coverage is going to be like you know, f flat sparkling water yeah, well, or, or bad champagne or something. The Clinton campaign got into this mode of attacking Trump personally. So for the last month of the campaign, none of the ads talked about the economy. Yep. And there was a case for the economy. Just like when Al Gore ran in 2000, yeah. he could have talked about the strength of the economy and he chose not to. Hillary Clinton made the same kind of mistake because the economy was doing okay, not great. But unemployment was pretty low. There was a story to be told, but she didn't talk about that. Instead, she kept going after Trump. And it's like, you know, attack, personal attacks from Hillary Clinton on Trump, given her own, you know, personal standing within the public, whether that's warranted or not, is a different issue. It just didn't resonate. Well, it's a different, it's a different way of thinking about it, the campaign, too, which is, at the end of the day, it's like, I got to excite my base to get them out. Yeah. And maybe that's what she was doing. But he was exciting his base to turn out, and I don't know what the data show about turnout, in a different way right. on the economy. And so the, there were kind of two very different ways of thinking about yeah. what, it, what am I going to do. And then she's in Georgia and, yeah. and I mean, Arizona. Arizona and, um, you know, of uh, course, now look, at it, it sounds like I know what I'm talking about. Just, I mean, you know, I mean, we're going to talk about sports now and I'm going to start <laughs> telling you about – you know, who's the best quarterback. But uh, I don't know much about politics, but it just seems to me, you know, if you've got to win those states, but, you know, someone sees polls, they it's might it. say, hey, well, you know, why would I go to Wisconsin? I'm up seven. Yeah. And they've never seen anything like it. But, you know, I always think if you've never seen anything like it, maybe the polls aren't accurate. Well, the I mean, it's like looking at a patient – in a hospital, and you say, well, this is this, this is this, this is this, but I've really never seen anything presented to me like this. So before I do A, B, and C, I better figure out how do I respond to something I've never seen before. No, oh, I, and I think that's the kind of the internal the, the political instincts that someone like a Bill Clinton and in some sense Trump had, where Hillary Clinton didn't have it. I mean, if you take a look at the polls, the national polls weren't terrible. The national polls had, at the end, had Clinton right. up by three points. She ends up winning by two percentage mm -hmm. points. So they're not that off. But what happened is that in the Midwestern states, those states with large numbers of less than college-educated whites, we got all those states wrong, polling yeah. did. And I think basically that that group of voters are so mad that they don't trust anything, including polls, and they weren't answering them. So that group of people that were surveyed – was too tilted towards Hillary Clinton because you weren't getting the Trump Trumpers, so to speak, to even take a poll. Right. And so then they were waiting from this bad data that it, because all polls have to be weighted, and you assume that what data you do have is is reasonable, and you wait from that. Well, that's a big assumption that this election, I think, is going to give pollsters real pause and figure out how to move forward because we got well, it wrong. Yeah, I, I think another thing, and uh, our good friend, colleague Josh Clinton, and you talked about this, which is his strategy was to, to so delegitimize institutions yeah. and organizations that you could maybe see that if you called a Trump supporter in one of those states or other states, you were part of the problem. Yeah, the pollsters were I couldn't agree part more. of the problem. I couldn't and agree so, more. And so, and then he kept saying, "You don't understand. They're going to come out. They're going to vote for me. No one's in touch with these people." Yeah. And are there data that show that that maybe there was a kind of skewing of the polls because yeah. the people 
he was so convincing about disintermediation that it's between me and Trump, me and the candidate. I don't want to talk to anyone else anymore. Yeah, I think th there's some evidence, and and our friend Josh is, uh, you know, working on it, so to speak, as we uh, as we talk, where. The national polls have basically washed out, but because there were in so certain states, Iowa, Ohio, Wisconsin, there was a big chunk of whites less than college educated. That was the group that changed it. So you had enough bias in those particular states because of the demographics tied to those states that it led to the errors. The polls weren't, you know, the, we did the Vanderbilt poll. It was spot on for Trump. We Calling Trump to win the state is hardly an insight. Right. Um, but... We didn't get it wrong, right. but that's because the demographic makeup of the state is different than what you see in Ohio and Iowa. I mean, if you think about it, Ohio was ground zero for both campaigns, and yet he won by eight points. Right. I mean, that's unbelievable. Right, and, that. and the same thing with Wisconsin. All those states were just off, and if she had adjusted resources and taken Wisconsin and Michigan, both were winnable if she'd have put more resources into them. Um, even in the last week of the campaign, when she was deciding where to put her her designee, she sent Al Gore out to campaign. There was a choice between whether to go to Wisconsin or Colorado. They decided to send him to Colorado, which tells me they thought Colorado was more vulnerable than Wisconsin. Which is totally wrong. <laughs> totally wrong. Yeah, totally wrong. Yeah. Totally wrong. What, uh, you know, I think one of the things that uh, is, to me, paradoxical about our president is – you know, everything is thin skin. Mm -hmm. And he calls the acting director of the National Park Service, who maybe the last time someone did that was Teddy Roosevelt when he was going to be the environmental president. Right. Uh, maybe he created the National Park Service. But calling the head of that, the acting head. Yeah, the acting and, head. I mean, and give me some photos that show that the crowds were yeah, big. Yeah, the crowds, and then he's thin-skinned about this, and you know, he's at the CIA, and... But yet there's a sense to me that when he throws out, I'm going to have a 20% tariff on Mexico. And that's how I'm going to pay for the wall. And then there's this policy blowback, which was pretty strong from the Republican Congress, mm -hmm. yeah. including some in the uh, Freedom Caucus. And right. I mean, I think the thin skin is there, but I think he almost doesn't care because he's giving somebody a piece of news to chew on. And they're going to talk policy. He's on to the next thing. Oh, He's yeah. canceling the next meeting. He's with Prime Minister May talking about, you know, Fortress Atlantic. I mean, they're all playing last week's game. Oh, that's right. That, so I think the thin skin, I understand it. I've never uh, – I've actually met him once. And um, but I don't know him at all. But I think people are kind of missing the misdirection moves that – He's just into the new news next news cycle. That's right, and he's, and he's created it. it. That's right, and he's he created, created it. it, and he loves, and that's the kind of attention yeah. he gets all the time. Yeah. And you know, and people, you know, I was reading all these comments and about the tariff, and we don't, you know, and now, I think one of the things about you know alternative facts or real facts, or arguable facts, um, I think one thing that is interesting to me though is he doesn't maybe get deep into or care about the facts and. Mm -hmm. But yet when the facts come out to show he's wrong, he ain't going to argue about it. He's just going to move on yeah. or let it sit and then come back to it. So I think one of the most shocking kind of things is in the whole presidential election, I'm slapping tariffs on. I'm slapping tariffs on. I'm creating jobs. I'm slapping tariffs on. Yeah. And, you know, the Republicans and even the Democrat free traders are like – that is a tax on Americans, and it'll kill some jobs. And so, but you run the election, you win. Now he says, I'm going to slap some tariffs on. And now you have the people in Congress, particularly the Republicans control, saying that destroys jobs. It's a tax on Americans. Let me explain to you how it really works. Yeah. And I think where the media is going to maybe get tripped up is, okay, this may not get through. He almost doesn't – I don't want to say doesn't care, That's right. but it's almost like, well, you don't understand. That is like going back to the Big Bang time for him. Yeah, no, that's that, actually that's, right. It's kind of like, well, you know, I'm going to put a banking freeze on with Mexico. I mean, it's yeah. just 
the next new thing. Isn't that really what he's doing? He didn't. He there. He may not get his way, and I think there is going to be a point where he's not going to get his way on some of this legislation. Yeah, I th- but for a guy who doesn't really say, I'm not going to get deep into policy. I'm not going to get deep into the facts. I mean, he's just going to say, I'm going to get them to pay for the wall. I mean, I will get that done. I mean, that, and and he, that's just the way he is. Even if it's not true, he didn't care. No, he doesn't. He doesn't care about that. And I think the you know the the media the media just don't know how to deal with him for a variety of reasons. Partly because of alternative facts, and and he makes these claims that make people crazy. But he wants the deal. He wants to cut the deal. He does not. We you know when we when traditional politics and traditional news media coverage kind of rely on two things. One is that we have a shared set of facts. And second, that we have a, an ideology that provides a basic predictor for how somebody's going to do. So we know, kind of know how Mike Pence is going to behave. Right. He's out you know, with a, with a pro-life group speaking to them because that's the issue that matters to him. He's predictable. Trump doesn't care about any of that. And, and he doesn't care about the facts. So that he just wants to get deals and he's interested, you know, it's like there's 20 deals out there to be made, and he's going to start laying bets on all of them and making opening. He doesn't know which which of those will pay off or not pay off, and he doesn't particularly care because it's the process that he loves, and that's what's rewarded him financially over the course of his of his career. Some things have failed, some things haven't, and he's managed to to dodge the the failures and still remain wealthy. And that's kind of how he approaches it, and it's and it yeah. just has. Those folks who cover media and comment on it, it has them crazy. Yeah. Hey, John, before we adjourn for the day, you know, let me thank you. But, you know, there are going to be a lot of people looking at the next 100 days. And, you know, I want you to kind of give them a sense of what are the two big blockbuster things that President Trump or we're going to see out of the administration interacting with Congress in the next 100 days? What are your two bets? Boy, that's a that's an interesting question. I want to take something that's completely, I think, unexpected. I suspect that he's game to to go back on the Mexican promise, that he's going to actually find a way to get a, a deal and claim victory. That's the beauty that he because he's dealing in alternative facts. So, I don't necessarily think we're going to be building a costly wall. Uh, I could imagine that he finds some way to declare victory and he moves and he moves on. And the other one that I think is is very likely is he's going to find some way to get some infrastructure. Uh, serious infrastructure spending, despite Republican objections. Um, that's not such a big stunner, but I think that it's going to be something that he can then carry back when he decides to run the next time and say he brought jobs. We'll keep our eye on those. I've got a couple predictions, but I'll keep them to myself for now. Okay, well, Take that's care, a, a safer, safer move for sure. <laughs>